joy to have Professor Stephen Bopart with us from University of Urbana-Champaign. He, um, just to give you his background, he graduated with a Bachelor's of Science from Urbana-Champaign back in 1990 in electrical engineering with an option in bioengineering. He then did his master's in electrical engineering in microfabricated multi-electrode arrays for neural recording. Uh, he then spent some time at the Air Force Laser Laboratory in San Antonio, Texas, doing research on laser tissue interactions in the eye. I think that stimulated a lot of his later life, uh, where he went on to MIT to do his PhD in medical and electrical engineering and doctoral studies included the development of OCT, optical coherence tomography, in Professor Jim Fujimoto's lab. Uh, and this was as part of the Health Science MD-PhD program at the Harvard-MIT uh, School, uh, where he completed his MD at the Harvard Med School in the year 2000. He returned to Urbana-Champaign, started his research in optics and medicine. Uh, he is currently a full professor with appointments in electrical and computer engineering, bioengineering, and medicine. He's the head of the biophotonics imaging lab at the Beckman Institute for Advanced Science and Technology along with his team of researchers, investigates novel optical diagnostic imaging technologies. He's published, I, by my count, well over 150 peer-reviewed papers, uh, has funding from National Institute of Health, as, as, well, as well as a few other agencies. Uh, he served as the founding director of the Mills Breast Cancer Institute and holds a joint position with the Carl Foundation Hospital and Carl Clinic in Urbana-Champaign. Uh, his efforts have continued in infrastructure building working on building a new building and developing new infrastructure for translational research technology in breast cancer between the university and the Carl Foundation Hospital, and he helps coordinate a campus-wide imaging initiative to leverage the strengths of the uh, various faculty there. So it's a real pleasure to have him here. I've, I've met him at several conferences. It's always been a pleasure, and so I know that we're in for a stimulating talk uh, from a, a wonderful researcher. So please welcome Steve Bopart. Well, well, thank you very much, Brian, and, and thanks to all of you for that, uh, that introduction and, and welcome. And uh, it just really has been a, a pleasure for me to, to visit uh, your campus and many of you. Uh, I spent the last day and a half uh, just meeting with people and just really learning about the, the exciting dyna dynamics that you have here between these fields of engineering and medicine. And that really is uh, an essential topic uh, to my talk today on how these multiple fields, not just engineering and medicine, but maybe also many other biological sciences and physical sciences can come together uh, in new, many new ways to discover things. And the title of my talk, as you see here, is uh, uh, entitled Blinking Tumors and other ways to uh, molecularly image uh, cancer. And that hopefully will become obvious as I go through uh, much of my talk. I wanted to first uh, start off by giving you a little bit of an introduction of, of my laboratory at, at the University of Illinois. Uh, we call ourselves the Biophotonics Imaging Laboratory. And we do a, a, really a, a broad range of, of investigations and activities. We do a lot of work in designing uh, optical systems, so even new optical laser sources, uh, integrating these with uh, data acquisition systems and, and even beam delivery systems, whether they be catheters to allow us to get the light into uh, remote places in the body, into coronary arteries, into the, the GI tract. Uh, we build microscopes and portable systems that we can then translate and take into more patient-based uh, uh, settings. We also, coupled with this hardware, will develop a, a large number of different software approaches to, to extract the information from these optical signals in many different ways. We ultimately want to extract information that has clinical significance and, and how best we can do that. Now, with these optical te techniques, we apply them to many different areas. And we start off by looking at using advanced optical microscope techniques to look at cells and cells in engineered tissues, cells cancer cells and how they migrate through tissue, um, and even developing biology and how these cells will organize in those structures. Using optical coherence tomography, or OCT, we do a lot of high-resolution structural and functional imaging. These happen to be a small tumor in a dog muscle. This happens to be a tadpole, where we can see all these internal structures non-invasively. Now, we also, one of the, the adjuncts of optical imaging is that we can measure mechanical properties. And these have a high degree of correlation to disease as well. 
Now, with optics, we weren't satisfied with just the resolution that optics necessarily can give us. We wanted to look at molecules and where molecules reside in the body. And so developing you know, a whole host of molecular imaging techniques, really the focus of what I'll talk about today, um, has helped us to be able to look at site-specific disease and understand how those may even be treated. And finally, we develop all of these techniques with the ultimate goal of trying to translate them into clinical applications. And so we have a number of studies that occur either on patient tissue or actually in the hospital or surgical setting uh, where we can use these techniques. Well, we're motivated by what we see occurring in, in biomedical imaging in general. And that is, we want to image at smaller and smaller size scales. We necessarily want to get down to the level where disease starts at the molecular origin, at the cellular origin, and we want to catch disease at its earliest stages. And so that's really what's been driving us to take these uh, molecular imaging approaches. And if we look at molecular imaging across all of biomedical imaging, we see that this is making an impact across all these different modalities. So whether it be magnetic resonance with a lot of the spectroscopy or contrast agents that can be added to target to specific uh, sites, or nuclear medicine, optical imaging, x-ray CT, or even ultrasound that uses small little micro bubbles uh, to provide contrast and label cells and tissues. We see that there's this general trend in imaging to push to these smaller and smaller molecular size scales. Well, if we look at optics, what unique advantages does optics have for molecular imaging? And this is sort of a, a metaphorical diagram of a contrast agent, an optical contrast agent. And it's really meant to, to show that there's many, many parameters and options that we have available to us. If we start at the core and we think of some platform, whether they be a nanoparticle or a little liposome or a microsphere, these each can have different optical properties. Fluorescence, bioluminescence, maybe they absorb light, um, maybe they're birefringent and change the polarization state of the light. Maybe those optical properties are static or maybe they're dynamic. Maybe we can change them uh, to enhance contrast in different ways. And so then we can detect those optical signals, we, maybe the amplitude or the phase of that optical signal, or maybe different wavelengths of that signal, and then apply it to this wide range of medical applications. And that's really what this is meant to show, is that if we look at optical imaging, we have lots of different options available to us and different parameters that we can explore. Well, one of those, that I want to focus on is optical coherence tomography, or OCT. And this is a technique that is pretty much the optical analog to ultrasound. So we're all familiar with ultrasound imaging, but if we send in light, we get reflections of light that come back. And we can perform optical ranging that allows us to, to produce images like this. These are cells uh, in a living tadpole as we're scanning in three dimensions through the structure. And this happens to be a beating tadpole heart in real time. Uh, that allows us to look at dynamic processes. So this, this type of, of uh, OCT imaging can be done in real time. It can be fast. And it also has uh, ability to be put down endoscopes or delivered to different places within the body. Now, if we think about the use of light in tissue, we have to also think about, well, how will that light propagate through tissue? What, what happens? when that light enters and passes through tissue. And this happens to be a plot of the absorption properties of various tissues dependent on different wavelengths of light. And what you'll notice is that right in the middle there's a dip. There's a dip in these traces, and this is called the biological window into tissue. It's really where absorption is low, and a lot of the attenuation is governed by optical scattering. So a classic example of this is I'm sure all of us uh, uh, you know, growing up or camping out or on Halloween, you know, took that flashlight and put it in your mouth to scare your friends, right? And uh, that was white light coming out of that flashlight, but it made your head glow red. And the reason it was glowing red is because all of those wavelengths of light that are down here were absorbed by your tissue. And it was the red wavelengths of light that actually passed out of the tissue and made your head glow red. And so, so this is the type of wavelengths we want to use, where we can pass these wavelengths quite far into tissue and be able to recover where those photons go and construct an image uh, based on those, uh, those um, photons that are coming back. Well, with OCT, again, with optics, it's quite portable and a modular system. In fact, a lot of the core technology for OCT is based on fiber optics. 
So just as the telecommunications industry uh, grew and developed with new types of detectors and optical sources, uh, optical fibers, uh, that technology was leveraged for OCT technology. And so now we have systems that uh, can be made even much smaller than this, this type of a cart, uh, roughly the size of a suitcase or even smaller. And they could be uh, modular and configured with things such as a surgical microscope, uh, handheld probes that look a lot like a laser pointer to scan across tissue, or maybe needle biopsy probes where our optics are now within the needle itself. And we can use this optical feedback and imaging to guide us where we want to put that needle. Well, when, when we collect OCT images, uh, it's really a systematic process. We may position our, our laser beam over one spot of the tissue, and we can collect a depth scan, just like an ultrasound uh, scan might, uh, might be performed. And so a single axial scan represents uh, this type of a signal, and we simply will scan our beam across the tissue and build up our two-dimensional or our three-dimensional images uh, simply by uh, assembling those into arrays. So this allows us then to sample the three-dimensional structure of tissue. Uh, it also allows us, as you can see, um, to see structures at micron scale resolution, at the resolution of single cells. And this is something that is also been called uh, an optical biopsy of tissue. Rather than having to take tissue out and look at it under a microscope, we've got a system here that can give us that same type of microscopic image. Uh, one other thing perhaps you'll notice is that our, our penetration depth is a bit limited. So we can only image a few millimeters deep into scattering tissue like skin or muscle. Uh, and that's because we have to keep track of where those photons go. We have to be able to know that they go into the tissue, get scattered, and come back to our instrument. And where some of the work that Brian and many other people that have looked at diffusion type techniques Photons do go tens of centimeters through tissue, but they tend to scatter and bounce around, and, and it's much more difficult to create uh, this type of high-resolution image. So we have to deal with this limitation of a uh, limited depth of imaging, but we, we make do with that by delivering this light to the tissue that we want to look at. Well, I won't go into the many different applications where this can be applied. This just highlights some of the work that we've done uh, in my group, and it was really using interoperative OCT for guiding uh, breast surgeries, and in particular, uh, breast conserving surgery where a breast mass uh, tumor is resected, taken out of the tissue, and what's of interest is whether or not that specimen has a positive margin. If there's any tumor cells left on the margin of that specimen, that means there's tumor cells left behind in the patient. So we did a, a study that looked in, and clearly identified normal margins from those that are abnormal. And when we start seeing these dense collections of, of scattering structures, these are cells, these are dense tumor cells that scatter very differently compared to normal margins. And this is just the, the actual histology section to compare with what we can collect in the operating room in real time. And so this is one method which we feel now can reduce or perhaps even eliminate the need for patients that have to come back for second or third surgeries uh, that's um, you know, often found after the surgery uh, occurs. Other things we do interoperatively is look at lymph nodes, which tend to tell us whether or not the cancer has spread. And, and like I said, guiding these types of needle biopsies to localize tumors. So that's just one example of, of where we eventually want to go with many of these techniques. Let's turn a little bit more uh, attention to the topic of, of molecular imaging. And if we think of contrast, of how contrast is generated in these images in OCT, we see that there's many ways that that image can change. There may be functional or physiological changes, such as blood flow that produces a Doppler effect. Or maybe there's ways of sensing birefringence. There's also ways of, endo of sensing endogenous contrast. Can we actually tell from the light that we get back? Can we tell whether or not there's molecular changes? Are there certain molecules like melanin or oxy or deoxyhemoglobin? One of the things I'll touch on at the end of my talk today is, is an optical way, a nonlinear optical way, of sensing uh, molecular bonds uh, using these, these optical principles. And that's a way of molecular imaging without any types of contrast agents. Now, the other way to provide contrast is to give uh, administer a, a contrast agent. And the important thing that we have to think about is OCT does not sense fluorescence. 
So OCT is based purely on looking at reflected, scattered photons that come back. And all those images that I was showing you were based on just the natural optical properties and the differences in the, in the tissue. Well, there's also a wide range of fluorescence techniques that, that uh, rely on putting in fluorophores to label structures. I just want to make the point that this is a very different type uh, of those. When we design these probes, we have to think about the engineering issues of how big they are, where they might go as they circulate through the body, are they biocompatible. We also have to think about our engineering aspects of how do we detect the signals that these generate. And this is really a synergistic approach. We have to consider both of these to optimize both and really come up with this, this way of, of optimizing our detection and the, the agents that we're using. If we look at these types of agents, we see that they can cover a wide range, much like that metaphorical diagram I showed you. They could be based on scattering, uh, such as uh, proton, uh, protein microspheres, or based on absorption of light, or maybe a wavelength-dependent absorption. Um, and one of the things that I'm going to focus on today is a technique we've developed called magnetomotive uh, imaging, both from various nanoparticles or these microspheres that can provide this unique magnetomotive signal. So when we think of molecular OCT techniques, they span this, this range of things that are exogenous, whether they be contrast agents that we administer, or whether we use spectroscopic methods to look at the wavelength differences, or endogenous methods that really are just looking at finding the molecules that are there naturally in the tissue. And can we produce images based on those endogenous molecules? Well, let me talk about magnetomotive imaging. And this slide sort of introduces this concept uh, before we get into the details. The idea is that we want to start with magnetic nanoparticles. And we want to distribute those into tissue. And we want to apply some external perturbative magnetic field. And it's actually going to cause those magnetic nanoparticles in the tissue to modulate, uh, to, to move up and down, and to be detected optically. And we can then change from a standard OCT type image of a tumor to one that we can actually identify uh, and with this enhanced magnetomotive contrast. Uh, and, and as you'll see, there's many other types of um, uh, benefits we can gain from that type. So these targeted imaging uh, has some, uh, some restrictions on what we want to do with these contrast agents. They, of course, have to be uh, biocompatible. They have to be small enough to be able to be injected, say, into the, into the bloodstream, to actually get out of the bloodstream and find a target, a tumor. And finally, have this molecular specificity so they only stick to uh, the tumor and, and nowhere else. Well, we found that these magnetic agents are actually quite uh, interesting to use because they're externally controllable. They, in fact, also can be used for MRI. These same types of particles have been used for MRI contrast. Uh, and because normal tissue is not highly ferromagnetic, we have the possibility of a very large dynamic range of this type of contrast. Well, these are some electron micrographs of what these nanoparticles look like. They're on the scale of about 20 nanometers. Uh, these are iron oxide nanoparticles. And, uh, and many of these come from commercial vendors. However, we can also make, our, make these our, ourselves. And what we do is we put these uh, into tissue, into our tissue sample. And the difference for our magnetomotive system is that we use a standard OCT system, but now have that electromagnet that's really small and just over the tissue. It's controlled by a power supply that allows us to switch this on and off. And when we switch this on, it's going to exert, that magnetic field is going to exert uh, a force on these particles. And that force is going to be proportional to the particle volume. It's actually proportional to the magnetic field, the, the gradient that's produced in the tissue. And even though we may have a very small particle, uh, we use very low field strengths, uh, just 0.09 Tesla or so. And you can see that it's just a small force a small perturbative force on this particle. But it's enough for us to sense uh, this change. We see these types of changes uh, when this particle is moving up and down. The OCT signal actually will change in amplitude and change in phase, depending on how that particle is moving up and down. And these are just examples. This is a phantom where we apply different uh, modulation patterns of our magnetic field. And we can see these particles 
tracking this type of modulation and providing this type of tissue contrast. When we quantify this, we really see that these particles are really only moving on the order of about a, a few hundred nanometers. So extremely small displacements. Now if we change, of course, the field strength, we can, we can move these particles over larger distances. But we do have a form of external control that allows us to, 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 to keep track, not only control where these particles are going, but actually measure and, and keep track of, of what they're doing. So this work, this started, some of our first publications were back in 2005. And we started by labeling uh, macrophages uh, that tend to, these are cells that tend to engulf anything foreign to them. And uh, they will engulf these magnetic particles. And if we then suspend these cells into a three-dimensional gel, uh, and we use standard OCT, these tend to show up as just very amorphous blobs of signal. Uh, these, these cells are about at the resolution limit uh, for our system. But then if we use our magnetomotive approach, we can actually see which of those cells have taken up this iron oxide. And they show this magnetomotive type signal. It's a way of labeling. And in fact, only about 50% of those cells had taken up uh, that magnetic uh, contrast agent. So it's a way of labeling cells. It's also a way of seeing um, contrast within tissue. This, these are uh, magnetic nanoparticles that were injected into skin. And if we look at uh, our control sample and the, the sample with the magnetic nanoparticles, and we just look at the structural OCT, you can see that there's a, maybe a, a slighter, slight increase in scattering, uh, but not significant. Um, when we turn on our magnetomotive approach, we see that these all light up. And in fact, if we can overlay these, and we can see where these uh, individual particles have localized. So we don't really see the scattering from the particles themselves. They're too small uh, to really give an appreciable amount of scatter. But what we do see in the way that this technique works is that these, cell, these particles are bound to the matrix. They're bound to proteins or the cell, uh, the extracellular matrix. And these particles will ex exert force on the surrounding tissue. And it's the tissue movement that we're actually sensing with our OCT changes. So these are just some other examples where now um, this is actually in vivo imaging where we have a control and we've got uh, uh, an injected tumor here where these magnetic nanoparticles show up as they distribute. Uh, through this tissue. And we needed to find out, well, what are the dynamics of these particles? Because uh, these are nano-sized particles. They can go everywhere. And we did a, a pretty systematic study to look at how these nanoparticles distribute. This is uh, muscle tissue from a rat, uh, lung tissue. And these are the time course magnetomotive OCT images of, of how these particles were taken up into uh, these tissue samples. These samples were ex vivo. Um, they were out of the body. They were put into sort of a, they were marinated in a solution of nanoparticles. And we kind of watched how those particles diffused uh, into these tissues. But we found some interesting characteristics. We found that, that as, uh, depending on the tissue property, uh, we could see very different types of diffusion dynamics. Um, we also noticed that we don't see a typical diffusion wavefront. So we have a high concentration of particles, and we don't necessarily watch them at this wavefront move into tissue. Instead, what we saw is a rather abrupt uh, you know, low signal, and then all of a sudden very bright. And that got us thinking, well, the origin of the signal may be not necessarily the presence of the particle, but how it's bound to the matrix. A diffusing particle is not really bound in any way, and so we don't really see a signal from a diffusing particle. But once that particle becomes attached, Maybe that diffusion gradient slows down, uh, becomes less strong. Um, maybe it's bound in some way. Then all of a sudden, we start to see that signal. So we did a test in a, a gel. This is your five-minute epoxy from the hardware store. Uh, and we mixed in nanoparticles. And we noticed that when this was in a liquid state, we saw no signal. There was no binding. Uh, the particles that were, uh, uh, when the field was applied, the particles just they moved. They were not bound. But as that gel solidified, our magnetomotive signal peaked and, and became larger and larger because it was now in a viscoelastic medium. And it could now respond. It had a restoring force. We would perturb it with our magnetic force, let it go, and it would restore um, based on the, its binding properties. And then finally, as that gel hardened and become solidified, there was really no more elastic properties 
of it uh, that were appreciable, and our signal uh, decreased as well. Now we notice the same type of response uh, in tissue, and so as the stiffness of the elastic modulus of the tissue got higher and higher, the resonant frequency at which these particles will move got higher and higher as well. And this type of linear relationship uh, was in, is important for us, as, as you'll see. Now, our end goal was still to figure out how we can get these particles to the site of the tumor to label these structures. So we worked a, a great deal about trying to conjugate antibodies to these nanoparticles. Now, antibodies are really the, uh, uh, the molecule that does, has a lot of the targeting properties in biological systems. Uh, there are a lot of the immune properties. And what we did was uh, we took our magnetic nanoparticles and we developed a way at which these antibodies were all conjugated in this, fa this fashion. So sort of the, the, uh, the stem portion of this Y-shaped antibody were attached. And when we did that, that added a lot of advantages. First of all, uh, it, these particles were not readily taken up by macrophages. Macrophages will tend to, uh, they, they have a lot of these receptors for these, this, this stem, this FC component of these antibodies. And so these nanoparticles were able to evade a lot of the, the processes, these macrophages, that would normally try to clear these particles out of the, the organism or out of the system. And that turned out to be advantageous. Now the fact that they were oriented in this way uh, all of the, the recognition sites, the sites on those antibodies that recognize the tumor cells, are largely at this, this Y portion. And so that allowed us to have very good selectivity specificity for our target sites. So a lot of immunology, a lot of uh, biochemistry here, but there's a great deal of work that has to go into to this aspect for us to optimize this targeting. Well, these were some of our results that uh, are just going to uh, be coming out very shortly next week. Um, this was a set of, of animal studies using rats that had tumors induced in their mammary tissue. And we administered uh, agents that were targeted with these antibodies, that were non-targeted, and just basically saline control. And we can see that clearly there was a strong signal from the targeted agents in the tumors with magnetomotive OCT and nowhere else. Uh, these are the control, the OCT images of those tissues. We did also histology. We looked at the actual tissue sections from all these organs. And, and these graphs really summarize everything. In our in vivo tumor, or ex vivo, after the animal was euthanized, we saw all of the signal coming from the tumors with the targeted agents, and just very little for the non-targeted or saline. If we looked at where these, these particles distributed throughout the body, we can see that for the targeted agents, really the majority all went into the tumor. Uh, there was also some signal from the spleen, but because the spleen has a, a ferritin, which is a uh, magnetic as well, there's some false positive signal from the spleen. Now, if we didn't target those, they all went to the liver as kind of what we would expect. So there's a great deal of work that has to go on to, to figure out the, the biodistribution the physiology, where these go in a living system. And that's a, that's a very important element, but we're quite happy with how well those behaved. Now, because these are iron oxide, uh, they function very well also as MR contrast. And so if we look at um, these, we can see that um, this is sort of the marker here, and this is sort of the increasing dose, that as the dose of these particles increased, we see that the, the the MR signal decreased. So these happen to be a negative contrast agent, a negative T2 contrast agent. But it is something that's detectable with MRI. So as part of this animal study, we wanted to verify where these particles were going. And we did MRI, and we found these tumors before and after injection. And it's a bit hard to see from just this raw data. But if you look at these plots, what this shows is that before injection, we had this blue curve. And after injection, we see that curve shift in the negative direction, the peaks of those. And that means that that tumor was loaded with magnetic nanoparticles. If we used, uh, in this case, non-targeted, we see that there is kind of this equivocal uh, change. And in fact, if we just use a, kind of a saline control, we see that there's a shift, but it's actually in the opposite direction. So really not informative. This, is, this type of information tells us 
that indeed with MRI we're able to find these particles and where they localize. So we've got a technique that can provide this type of unique magnetomotive contrast. The other aspect, because we are physically perturbing these particles, we can do what's called elastography, and we can measure the biomechanical properties of tissue. So this is an, an OCT image. It's an amplitude-based image of just a phantom, a tissue phantom that has scatterers in there. And um, we had to not only develop a phantom that had looked optically like tissue, but also now mechanically like tissue. So we had to tailor the silicone matrix to get the right elasticity. Uh, the right mechanical properties. And then, we, of course, we added our magnetic agents that we want to sense. When we, when we administer these magnetic transients, when we switch our magnetic field on and off, if we look very closely at these signals, we see that there's perturbations uh, in these, these particles as, as we've been imaging before. Uh, this happens to be what's called an M mode. So we're focused, we're fixed at one position in our sample. And we're looking at this now over time instead of uh, uh, producing an image. If we look at these transients more closely, we see this, this sort of underdamped oscillation, which is, is classic for a viscoelastic material. And we see that as we turn our field on, we see both an amplitude and phase fluctuations. And as we shut that off, we also see similar types of fluctuations. So by, by actually recording the optical signals that are fluctuating this way, we can back out the viscosity and the elasticity of these materials at the, the micron scale, where these individual particles are localized to. And this gives us a very unique capability, because uh, it's often, when mechanical measurements are made on tissues, uh, it's often over the bulk. And it's sometimes very difficult to, to sample the mechanical properties on this size scale. So much of this work was done um, in phantoms to really demonstrate that we can measure this material elasticity. And what we can see is as the elasticity or the stiffness uh, of this material changes, so does this, uh, this, these oscillation frequencies. And in fact, we've got a, a very linear relationship between the elastic modulus and what this frequency is that we can measure. So here we have a way, again, of, of probing at the micron scale the mechanical properties of tissue. And this is actually where this term blinking tumors or blinking tissues came about. So uh, to give you a bit of a historical perspective, when we first started working on this idea, I had an undergraduate in my laboratory. And we were talking about how you know, we can modulate these particles and they will modulate this signal. And he thought, he said, you know, he said, cool, this is one day we're going to have blinking tumors, that we're going to be able to see this type of modulation. And you know, our eyes naturally will watch things that, that are moving and are dynamic. And it may be a very different way of providing contrast for us to, to readily visualize. And so this is um, uh, just some examples. Uh, I have to tell you that this is a, a, how these were acquired. These are um, magnetomotive uh, uh, OCT signals. So that's the green channel. Uh, and that's overlaid over the OCT image, which is the red channel. And then the green signal, which is the, the magnetic nanoparticles, that signal is actually modulated by the response, the optical coherence elastography response of that tissue. So that's how we use that information to, to basically put together this, these types of modulations. And so really depending on uh, you know, what that frequency is, the natural frequency of the tissue, these are going to blink in, uh, in many different ways, at different amplitudes, different frequencies and um, be able to accentuate that type of contrast. And where we want to go with this is, is to acquire a system that's fast enough where we can not only do this on the tissue level, but at the column, single column level, and even at the pixel by pixel level. So eventually, we want to get to the point where uh, our data, you see just this twinkling that perhaps is going on throughout the tissue. And that blinking, uh, the amplitude and the frequency corresponds to actually the mechanical properties of the tissue uh, at that site. OK. So that was work that was done using magnetic nanoparticles. But we also think that these types of, uh, and those are molecularly targeted uh, particles, we also think that these can be used for other types of contrast agents. And so we've, we've embedded these iron oxide particles into the core and the shell of microspheres. These happen to be about one or two microns in size. Uh, 
Um, so they're going to remain in the bloodstream. But the reason that we want them big is because that they can also carry drugs uh, inside their core. And that perhaps if we target these, we can then also have a drug release. Um, with these, these microspheres, this happens to be a, a 3D gel uh, without um, microspheres. And when we see those with microspheres, we see this magnetomotive signal coming from each of these, these microspheres. These are actually made using ultrasound. And we take uh, our, our different our, our liquids. So we have an albumin uh, protein layer here and our non-aqueous uh, liquid here. And we apply sound waves that will basically create a milkshake. And we create these bubbles. And, uh, and then we can filter out the, the size of these these spheres. Actually, we call them spheres, not bubbles, because they're filled with a liquid. Uh, we could fill them with gas or other things, but liquid because ultimately we want these to be drugs. Uh, and then we can look at these uh, individually in things such as our agarose gel. We, can, we know that the macrophages take those up uh, as well. And if we inject these into tumors, we can still see this type of contrast coming from these, these, these microspheres. Just as we did uh, targeting for the nanoparticles, we can target these microspheres. And what we've chosen to do with these is to add what's called an, an RGD peptide. Um, this is basically a polypeptide chain. This RGD sequence um, is really the ligand for what's called an alpha V beta 3 integrin receptor. These are, these are uh, receptors or integrins that uh, are expressed in things such as angio angiogenesis when a cancer forms or in heart disease, atherosclerosis. Uh, there's really a predominance of this type of, of, of molecule there. So those have been our targets for these. And we really did some studies that looked at what it was our, our, our optimal sequence. If we put that RGD sequence at the end of a polypeptide chain, as we conjugate it to our microspheres, we tend to get our best binding. And we've optimized a lot of that binding. And uh, even though this isn't cancer, this is an example in atherosclerosis. Uh, where we have uh, rats that were fed uh, a normal diet, and we administered these, these, nano, these microspheres. And we saw that there was just a few, uh, in fact, in the solution that had this, this aorta from this, uh, from this rat. And that's in contrast to if this rat has heart disease. If this rat has atherosclerosis, uh, we see that we start getting collections of these microspheres where these plaques, these early um, heart disease uh, lesions are found. And so we're really interested in trying to, to see if this can also be shown uh, ultimately in vivo in these, these living animals. Well, these two, again, can provide contrast in MRI. And it's that negative T2 contrast. So these are the kidneys uh, of a rat. And that's before we add the microsphere. The, uh, these are the nanoparticles. After the nanoparticles, we see that negative contrast, a darkening. And more dramatically, if we look at the microspheres, these microspheres really are captured by the liver uh, for clearance. And so before the agents, we see the liver, and really it just seems to disappear. There's just so much, uh, so many of these microspheres and, and these, nanopart these uh, iron oxide particles are taken up that it really just wipes out the MRI signal. And we can clearly localize where those, those are. Now, how do we want to deliver drugs with this technique? How can we deliver that type of therapy? Well, these types of microspheres are very much like microspheres, microbubbles used for ultrasound. And in ultrasound, you can deliver these microbubbles, and uh, they provide contrast. And you deliver a strong ultrasound wave, and it will pop these bubbles and rupture them. And so this, was, this is what was done. Uh, this was in a, a rat model that had a tumor. And uh, if we use the standard gas-filled microbubbles, we can see as we administer these microbubbles, sort of the scattering from the ultrasound scattering increased. And then these red bars uh, correspond to this ultrasound rupture pulse. And it bursts all these bubbles. And all of a sudden, the scattering drops down uh, because you've popped all those bubbles. Well, we weren't sure. These are bubbles that filled with gas. And when they're filled with gas, if you hit them with ultrasound, they will kind of modulate and vibrate. And that's really the origin of some of the contrast. Um, but if you fill the bubble now with a liquid, it doesn't do that so well. So we weren't really sure how well our protein liquid-filled microspheres uh, will react. But we were surprised to see that when we did um, administer to this, to this model, we saw this increase uh, 
in, in scattering. So we were seeing uh, signal, ultrasound signal from our microspheres, but we, what we also noticed then they were pretty difficult to, to, to pop. And we had to actually deliver not just one rupture, rupture sequence, but a whole range of these. And even still, then finally, we started to see this decrease in scattering. Now, after the animal was sacrificed, we did confirm that indeed, you know, we had microspheres everywhere with the magnetomotive OCT. And these microspheres also had a fluorescent dye, so we can find uh, where they, they, had dis they had gone. And many of them had ruptured and released this dye. And we think that this may be now a new mechanism that we can uh, be able to go in and uh, target these, uh, provide molecular contrast, but then also therapy by rupturing these bubbles. OK. I just wanted to um, uh, maybe close or talk about one last topic. And that has to do with uh, using uh, optical techniques to look at endogenous molecules. So we want to do molecular imaging with different molecules that are just naturally in the tissue. And we do that with this technique called nonlinear interferometric vibrational imaging and spectroscopy. And let me explain what that means and why we want to do this. Well, first of all, our motivation is that, in one sense, uh, histopathology, uh, looking at the tissue that, that was taken out, is really the gold standard. But there's problems with it because it's, it's highly subjective. And oftentimes, the inter and intra observer variations or accuracy is, is as low as 80%, meaning um, uh, sometimes very difficult for, for people to agree on what the tissue says. So we need more quantitative ways. And we want to, this work was really motivated to try to look at ways that we can generate this type of molecular contrast without staining tissue. And let me walk you through how we will, will do that. OK. Well, we have to go back to op thinking about optical scattering processes. And I just finished talking about OCT. And this is really an elastic scattering process, where we put in one wavelength and we detect the same wavelength that may be scattered back. There is inelastic scattering, where that wavelength changes. You put in one wavelength of light, it will generate things such as fluorescence or spontaneous Raman light. And that light that comes out is a different wavelength. Well, there's a group of inelastic scattering processes that also are coherent. And one of those is coherent anti-Stokes Raman scattering, or CARS. And the fact that this is coherent means that it might be detectable with uh, optical coherence tomography. And so we applied the same principles that we, we developed in OCT to now looking at this coherent signal uh, coming from molecules and tissue. Now, I won't go through all the, the energy level diagrams what I, to simplify what CARS does is basically think about that we have all these molecular bonds in our tissue. Okay, A carbon-hydrogen bond is just one example. And naturally, those bonds are going to resonate at some frequency or vibrate at some frequency. If we put in light that has two different wavelengths, and the difference of those two different wavelengths corresponds to that vibrational frequency, it will resonantly start vibrating. It's kind of like pushing someone on a swing. Right? You want to try to push at the same frequency. And every time, if you get time it right, that person is going to start swinging higher and higher. Uh, and that's what's happening he here. And as this vibration gets stronger and stronger, it's going to put out this car's beam. It's a different wavelength of light. But it's, it's light that is specific to the vibrational frequencies of that bond. Now, that light is coherent with the light that we're putting in. And so if we think about our OCT type system, if we put in those two beams of light, and let's say we send those two beams to a, a reference sample that, let's say, it's a particular molecule we're interested in, that's going to produce this CAR signal, shown in green here. And as we also put in some of those signals into our sample, if that same molecule is present in the sample, these two are going to interfere. And what we will detect is the presence of that molecule or molecular bond that's in our sample. And this was an example that just shows in a, in a liquid that um, this NIVI signal uh, in white is only coming from this liquid that has a particular molecular bond that's vibrating. And if we look at it just under a standard microscope, we see that it's actually in a, a glass cuvette, and there's lots of other structure there. But this is an example of where we now have molecular-specific imaging. 
We call this uh, nonlinear interferometric vibrational imaging, or NIVI. And I won't go through you know, all these details, but really only to say, as I've been saying, this is a coherent signal that we can detect. We can detect the amplitude and also the phase information. This is important and is what is different from this technique from many other CARS techniques. Because it allows us then to have a signal that's really proportional to molecular concentration. And before, that didn't really exist. Um, the other advantage is that we get signals uh, that come out very quickly. We, this is a resonant signal. We're actually amplifying or, or building up this signal. Uh, and because of that, we get a strong signal that allows us now to do imaging. The system uh, is really a, a more complex array of, of two lasers instead of one. Um, but this is something that right now we're working on trying to get into the same type of portable system as you've seen these, others, uh, these other systems. Well, we first wanted to compare this signal, our NIVI signal, with what the standard Raman signal is. And Raman is a technique that has been used uh, for looking at these vibrational spectra, um, but it's very weak. Uh, and so it's often difficult to do a lot of large, uh, fast imaging uh, with Raman. What we found is that uh, the Raman signal shown in red and our NIVI signal shown in black correspond quite well to one another. There's a couple of differences uh, that are on the edges that affect the difference in spectra. But this was very promising for us and, and allowed us to do this type of hyperspectral imaging. What this is, is it's that, uh, that um, um, what is this? This is a, a, like a silicone gel that uh, has a signal at this peak a strong peak at 2906, where we can see all these structures. And we still can take images at different other uh, wave numbers. And uh, this will actually show us uh, the distribution of these molecules at different, um, at different over the, across that spectrum. Now we then started looking, pointing the system at biological tissue. And this happens to be adipose or, or fat cells from a, from a rat model. And we can, again, get very good correspondence between Raman and this type of nonlinear imaging, this NIVI. But the advantage is that we can actually get that same signal, but 500 times faster um, than the standard Raman. So that is actually what allows us now to start taking images based on this molecular composition of tissue. We wanted to see if we can use these signals to differentiate tumor from normal tissue and do this again without contrast agents, just looking at the vibrational uh, uh, spectra coming from these, these different molecules. And so we had our different uh, beams, our laser beams that came in to our sample that's on our stage. Uh, and then we looked at the spectrum on a detector. And we produced images now of tissue, different tissue types from, from this rat model. And things such as adipose tissue, and this is the, the, the tumor tissue. Um, we noticed within this, 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 this data that we could distinctly see differences between normal spectra, which is shown in blue, and tumor spectra, which is shown in red. And in fact, if we look at what those signals are for collagen and methyl oleate, which is uh, basically like a lipid, um, we can see that they, they actually match quite well. And so what we're, we're, we're measuring here, the signal is predominantly collagen, or a fibrous protein, that's present in tumor, versus lipids that's present in, in the fat, uh, the ad adipocytes. When we take our images then, we can then begin to do spectral analysis and figure out pixel by pixel, you know, is that lipid, is that collagen, what molecules maybe are present at each of these, these pixels. So we did a study um, looking at different uh, mammary tissue from these rats. And with very good uh, accuracy, 99%, uh, well, let me back up. So these, uh, from these uh, sections, we were able to classify normal regions from tumor sections. And each of these little points and the ovals around each of them represents kind of four standard deviations away from, uh, from the mean. And drawing this, this sort of separation line was actually quite easy. So if you see on some of these points, uh, in here, uh, the blue is normal tissue, sort of the pinkish is more equivocal. Um, and then the red, of course, is all tumor. Uh, 
And then if we even get closer to this line where we have half normal, half tumor, um, we can still be able to resolve these differences on the order of maybe 100 microns. And so all of a sudden, we've got a way now without staining to be able to, to determine, um, is this a tumor? Is this normal? Uh, can we even draw margins um, using a computer-based approach to separate these different tissue types? And uh, this may be a way of, of performing um, histopathology with more of a quantitative assessment of the, the molecular composition. So just to summarize what, what I've talked about today, we've really I've been focusing on these optical uh, molecular imaging techniques. Uh, I've talked about these dynamic magnetomotive particles uh, and how these can produce signals and the very small forces on tissue. I've also talked about the scattering and the modulating microspheres, where these iron particles uh, in the microspheres can, can modulate those. How we can go about functionalizing or, or labeling these different particles. So when we put them into tissue, uh, into animal models, eventually into humans, that they will target and localize to tumors or other tissues that we're interested in. And not only to provide the contrast for imaging, but we think ultimately to be able to uh, administer therapy, uh, whether it be um, actually modulating these nanoparticles at high frequencies, at higher fields, and they heat up, which is a lot of the work that's uh, uh, ongoing here at Dartmouth. Or maybe it's, it's using these methods to release uh, the drugs that are contained within our microspheres and deliver localized therapy. We can do elastography by simply perturbing these particles and watching how they respond. We think that uh, we can characterize how those mechanical properties change. These particles can be used in, in MRI and in ultrasound. And so it allows us to really take advantage of the different optical properties or optical and, uh, and other imaging um, contrast modalities to localize these. Um, and finally, I touched on NIVI and how that's a, a technique, a nonlinear technique that can allow us to map out the endogenous molecular composition of tissue and ultimately we hope to be able to identify cancer. I, uh, I want to thank you for your attention but, and also thank uh, my research group at uh, the University of Illinois. We're at the, the Beckman Institute. And uh, just really what I want to emphasize is, is that this type of work is, is highly interdisciplinary, much like the work that's going on here at Dartmouth and, and this, this combination of engineering and, and medicine. And, and it's bringing people from many different backgrounds, engineering, physics, chemistry, uh, the life sciences, immunology, a lot of our clinical collaborators that come together. Uh, it's really that type of synergy that has to, has to sort of click for you to, uh, to begin to tackle problems that span all these different disciplines. So I think that's certainly something that um, um, you know, Dartmouth has embraced, but I, I think that's really our future in solving a lot of these complex problems that we face. And finally, just all of this really wouldn't have been possible without our, our financial support from our federal agencies. And uh, thank you once again for your attention. Yeah, yeah. So a lot of this sort of subcellular, cellular level uh, dynamics is an area that we're looking into now. So we, we have some rough idea that a lot of these are going to be bound by proteins, uh, you know, extracellular proteins. Um, some of these, these nanoparticles will be internalized by cells. I mean, they're so small that they actually diffuse quite readily through, you know, through many different types of tissues. Uh, you know, they, surprisingly enough, will not pass the stratum corneum of the skin. That's a very good barrier function, thank goodness. Um, but, uh, but we really don't understand you know, how these will behave. Uh, what, we, what we noticed in that, that study was that the stiffer the tissue, the longer it took for those particles to, to make it through. So, so clearly, you know, the matrix that binds that tissue, that makes it stiff, is also preventing these types of diffusion properties. Yeah, yeah. So the, the question was relating, can we use these particles to look at early, like metastases? Uh, 
And um, what we hope is that if, if, and this is really the hope for, I think, much of, of the work in the field, is that if we can get the, the sensitivity and specificity, the targeting ability of these particles up high enough, that we're able to be able to administer these systemically, and they will localize to even metastatic disease. Um, we've done some studies where um, that we've looked at administration of particles directly into the lymphatic system. And, and so you know, much of the drugs and everything to treat cancer systemically has been given intravascularly. Um, but we know that metastatic cancer also spreads readily through lymphatics. So we think that there may be some ways of, of administering in both routes. And we're trying to explore if we put these particles into the lymphatic system uh, that will circulate throughout the lymphatics, uh, we might be able to target metastatic disease that way too. So I think there's a lot of interesting things to do in that area. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So a lot of these images, no, no, no. A lot of these images were, um, you know, fairly low resolution just because of the way we acquired that data. Uh, but uh, but this this could be acquired at the same resolution as an optical microscope. So we would be able to have, you know, the same type of, uh, you know, subcellular resolution that the pathologist was it routinely uses to make those diagnoses. Uh, but you're right that, that there's pattern recognition that goes on, and, and it really is at all size scales. So, you know, subcellular, even nucleoli, looking at structures within nuclei, uh, looking at, uh, in fact, most pathologists, the first, the first view of a slide is, is really, you know, just simply holding the slide up, you know, into the light and looking at the overall, uh, any types of patterns or shadings or just, uh, colorations at that size scale. Um, and I think coupled with, uh, Oops, coupled with a lot of the other uh, methods of pattern recognition, being able to go in and look at uh, how we can take these molecular signatures coupled with pattern recognition uh, really can improve um, our, our diagnostic capabilities. So one of the things maybe that wasn't so obvious is, is that with that spectral data, the NIMI data, we show an image, but that is really only one image within a hyperspectral cube. So we have this whole cube of data uh, where two dimensions are spatial, but the third dimension is actually spectral. And at each spectral wavelength, that tells us a different molecular composition of the tissue. Um, we can then look at, within each image, the patterns. And, and all that information can kind of come together, I think, in a unique uh, diagnostic frame. Okay, so so um, traditionally, you know, s s tissue sections. Uh, the most traditional stain is hematoxylin and eosin. This is kind of the pink and purple stains. You probably saw some of the images um, throughout the talk. Uh, but this is really a fairly a fairly non-specific type stain of of tissue sections. Um, this is all stained after the section is taken. There's also techniques called immunohistochemistry, which are stains that will target specific cells or specific receptors or molecules. And, uh, and, and that, I think, is it becoming more and more advanced. Uh, that is one way, again, of labeling um, you know, all these structures. It, uh, I think what we're seeing here in NIVI uh, will allow us uh, essentially to represent you know, hundreds or thousands of these immunohistochemical stains. Because we get within that data set you know, all these types of molecular um, uh, mapping or, or, or concentrations, as opposed to having to stain each slide in a different way. Um, so I think that we're really after making things faster. Um, but that can all be done in vivo as well, without having to take out sections. And, um, and making it more quantitative, as opposed to just simply looking at uh, different stain sections and using the expert diagnostic uh, criteria to say what type of disease that is. <laughs> 
Yeah, yeah. So, so that's something we don't really quite know. I mean, we've, we've started looking at, uh, again, the cellular level, how these particles, even in cell culture, what happens to them. And uh, we think that, well, the, uh, those particles were targeted to the HER2 uh, receptor protein. Um, and so, you know, these are going to be external. We don't know if they're internalized, how those dynamics take place. Um, but that's something very interesting because, uh, as I was talking to Ursula and, and, and others, that, uh, you know, this effect of being able to internalize and concentrate uh, magnetic nanoparticles actually helps us because you'll get a stronger signal that way. And if we're going to be heating these to kill those cells, that will be advantageous as well. So I think that's kind of our next step is to really watch in real time uh, where these particles go and what happens. Yeah, you mentioned an analog to ultrasound, but do you transmit an optical pulse? And what on earth is your time resolution mm -hmm. coming back? <laughs> it's fast. Yeah, so, so we actually, uh, it's the analog to ultrasound because instead of sound waves, uh, we put in light waves. And that, that light could be in the form of a pulse. It could also be um, uh, somewhat continuous. It has to do with the coherence properties of the light. But instead of using the time gating that ultrasound uses in its detection, we use interferometry. So with interferometry, we have a reference arm, and we can compare uh, how the light traveled in the sample, and we compare it to how it travels in a reference. And it's that way where we can get the time resolution down to picoseconds, femtoseconds, you know, on the scale of the light propagation itself. Any chirp? Any chirp? Any chirp? Yes, yes. We have lots of trouble. Um, so there's a lot more technology. You know, hope, maybe it's a good thing I made it you know, too simple here. Um, but it's a lot more complicated than it seems. Um, because yes, we have to worry about how pulses propagate through tissue. They change their optical properties. They get dispersed. Uh, that decreases the resolution of the, sig of the pulse coming back. Uh, so there's lots of other uh, attention to detail here. But, um, but it, it seems to work. OCT um, has been a, a technique that's been commercialized now. It's really heavily applied in ophthalmology. And there's many commercial systems out there. Um, if, if you haven't already in your lifetime, you will have an OCT scan, at least of your eye. Um, uh, and uh, I think that we'll start to see techniques like this now move into uh, you know, non-ophthalmology -ophthalmolo applications. Yes. Yeah, yeah, there's, there's a lot of them. Um, when this car signal is generated, you're right, it, it does occur at internal. Uh, it's produced you know, wherever this molecular vibration takes place. A lot of the signal that's generated in cars is actually forward directed in the direction that the, of the incoming light beams. And what the, re the signal that we detect, um, the configuration I showed, we were really collecting the light in the forward direction. But what happens in, in tissue is that forward-directed cars get scattered back. And, and so we can still use uh, an OCT-type system and detect that backscattered light. Um, now, in terms of resolution, these are things that we, we, we haven't done much in vivo. Um, but um, we will see, uh, perhaps, a decreased resolution uh, because that signal that may be generated in one place is going to be scattered from many other structures. Uh, still, we can use coherent gating to really only determine the depth at which we're going to measure that signal from. So I, I think that as we move this into uh, you know, depth-resolved cars uh, and into tissue, a lot of these other issues are going to come up. Thank you.